So the 18th and 19th centuries were an age of ocean exploration. Mariners like James Cook and Charles Darwin sailed the world's oceans, trying new territories and describing thousands of new species. But these marine biologists knew what they knew about the species they studied because they dragged nets across the ocean bottom and dragged dead and dying organisms up onto the decks of their ships. They probably never put their faces in the water to see the organisms they studied live and in person in their habitat. And this is pretty much how marine biology was done for hundreds of years, that is until the 20th century, when Jacques Cousteau and his colleagues designed the aqualung, or as we know it, the self-contained underwater breathing apparatus, or simply scuba. Scuba allowed marine biologists like myself to throw a tank of air on our backs, put our faces in the water, leave the air-breathing world behind. We could see the species we study in their element, how they move, what they eat, even what eats them. But even with scuba, marine biologists are limited. If you're a scientist that studies the forest, you can go out to your field site at dusk or at dawn, stay until dark, you pretty much have unlimited time. As a marine biologist, we are tied to the air-breathing world. We can throw a tank of air on our back, stay for an hour, maybe two, before we have to go back to the surface. Our trip underwater is powerful, but brief. But FIU's Aquarius Reef Base allows us to cut these ties from the air-breathing world. The world's only undersea research station gives us the gift of time. Scientists can live for several weeks inside the Aquarius, actually living their science on the bottom of the ocean. Now, I'm a coral reef ecologist. I study corals and fishes and how humans affect reefs worldwide. And for someone who grew, grew up landlocked in northern Mississippi, whose parents really don't even know how to swim, I've done lots of cool things in the ocean. But by far the coolest thing I've ever done has been live for 20 days on the bottom, living and doing my science from the Aquarius. It is an amazing feeling to know that you've lived underwater. And that actually puts me in some pretty unique company. There have been fewer people to live underwater to do research than there have been people in space. Now, I know that seems like it's probably not right, that there are fewer aquanauts, they're rarer than astronauts, but this should tell you how unique and important the Aquarius is for understanding the future of the world's oceans. Now, the Aquarius is a pretty special place, as you can imagine. It sits off of Key Largo in 60 feet of water. It's about 45 feet long. It's actually about the size of a school bus. It's even painted yellow. And it gives you this gift of time to live on the bottom of the ocean. And the real power here is that you get to do saturation diving. So on a normal scuba dive, you get maybe two, three hours and a whole day to work at the depth the Aquarius is. But from the Aquarius, we can dive for eight to nine hours a day. So one day of diving from the Aquarius is like three to four days on normal scuba. A 10-day science mission lets you do one to two months of science in that 10 days. It essentially gives the marine biologist power to almost slow down time. But these pictures don't really do it justice. We thought we'd actually take you on a dive and send you there. That's about the reaction you get when you see the Aquarius for the first time. It's pretty cool. But the engine that actually makes the Aquarius run sits on the surface of the ocean. It's the LSB or the life support buoy. The LSB has power generators, air compressors, and wireless data connections that allow us to live our science in the bottom of the sea. Without the LSB, you are quite literally sunk. But you can't just be a brand new scuba diver and go do a mission in the Aquarius. It takes a week-long training to get used to the extra gear that you have and to make you safe underwater. And this training is all about tough love. So your aquanaut trainers like to give you a hard time. They'll sneak up behind you and turn your air off when you're not thinking about it. They'll rip your mask off to see if you freak out. And if you do, you're probably not a good candidate to be an aquanaut. They do this because if you have a problem in the Aquarius, in saturation, you can't go straight to the surface. 
your blood is saturated with nitrogen, and if you went straight to the surface, all that nitrogen would come rushing out, and you would pop like the cork on a bottle of champagne. Not a good place to freak out when you're underwater. But once you've been through this training, you are an aquanaut, and you're ready to live under the ocean. <laughs> and when you actually get down to the Aquarius, the first thing you notice is that you're under a little bit of pressure than you normally are. You can tell from this can of partially crushed mixed nuts that the pressure in the Aquarius is more than what we feel here. You can kind of feel it on your sinuses as the waves roll back and forth overhead. The Aquarius kind of acts like an accordion, squeezing your sinuses in and out. But you get used to that pretty quickly. When you're not diving nine hours a day, you're eating lunch, you're getting sleep, you're trying to warm up from a day out on the reef, you drink a lot of coffee, you eat a lot of peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, maybe some freeze-dried camp food when you're tired of PB&J. On one of my missions, we even had freeze-dried eggs from the Russian space program. I have no idea why they were there, but none of us were actually brave enough to try them. <laughs> but once you've had your meal and you've had your coffee, the magic really happens. It's time to leave the Aquarius. And you get in and out via this hole in the bottom. It's called the wet porch. You climb down in it, kneel down, put your gear on, lay down, and swim right out, literally right onto the reef. And the area around Aquarius is amazingly cool. The habitat's been down there for about two decades, so it's covered in sponges and corals, schools of big snapper and barracuda, even six-foot goliath grouper. But when you're ready to do your research, this is your commute. Not 45 minutes in Miami traffic, a five-minute swim out to your field site, and not the first rude hand gesture. <laughs> Easily the best commute I've ever had. And the real power of the Aquarius is it lets marine biologists do complicated science that we can't do on normal scuba. As I said, I study coral reefs, how to protect them, and how to conserve them. And coral reefs are worth billions of dollars to societies around the world. And here in South Florida, they're an economic engine, driving fisheries and tourism, even protecting our land from big storms. But reefs are imperiled worldwide. In some places, we've lost over 90% of the corals from our coral reefs, and the Aquarius allows us to set up complicated experiments to try to understand what actually causes the decline of corals and how the biodiversity of species in this system affects the health of coral reefs. And when we set up these experiments, we found that biodiversity is really very important to understanding coral reef systems. And that the biodiversity of species is a lot like good investing. You need a lot of different species on coral reefs doing different things, just like you need stocks and bonds and cash in your investment portfolio because they give you different returns. All these different fishes up here on the screen eat different types of seaweeds. And when all those fishes are there, the seaweeds are removed and the corals live a happy, healthy life. When we lose some of these species, coral reefs start to decline. And we wouldn't have been able to do these complicated experiments without the Aquarius. Now, once you've finished your science, your mission is over, you're ready to come to the surface, you have to go through decompression. And it's a 17-hour process that gradually allows those accumulated gases in your bloodstream to come out in a safe manner. So they close the doors in the Aquarius, and they slowly lower the pressure on the inside, essentially simulating bringing you to the surface. The Aquarius actually stays on the bottom of the ocean, but the pressure is lowered to the pressure we feel now, safely over 17 hours, sometimes breathing oxygen, as you can see up on the screen. After 17 hours, the hatches open on the Aquarius, we jump into the wet porch and swim right up to the surface. Happy marine biologists with days of productive science under our belts. But pictures and even a video can't really do the Aquarius justice. So now we're gonna send you six miles offshore of Key Largo to 60 feet of water to the bottom of the ocean where fellow marine biologist Mike Heithouse is gonna give you a live personal tour of the Aquarius. Hey Mike. Hey, Darren, thanks a lot. Hi, everybody. It is uh, a real pleasure to be able to talk to you today from the bottom of the ocean and the world's only underwater research habitat. Now, if I sound a little bit like a chipmunk, it's because of the pressure that Darren was talking about. And right now, I'm sitting at the uh, kitchen table that doubles as a science lab and the conference room. But uh, even at night, the view is one you uh, just can't beat. Now, I'm not going to be down here long enough to have to go through that long decompression that Darren talked about, but if I was, it would be no problem. We just close that door over there, and I'd have uh, plenty of time to catch up on reruns online. But uh, even though we're basically living in a decompression chamber, Aquarius is so much more than that. 
You know, Darren talked about all the amazing research that goes on here that's globally important. We can also deploy sensors around Aquarius that stream data back to us on land 24-7. We can use Aquarius to design and test new technologies for underwater. And this use may seem a little weird. It's actually important for the space program because it turns out that there's nowhere else on Earth where you can simulate the extreme environment at high stakes uh, that's like space. And the living accommodations, challenges, and activities are pretty similar. So before you do a mission up there, it helps to uh, work it out and train down here. But even though the research and training opportunities here are amazing, Aquarius may be even more important because it's part of the solution to a challenge that Darren and I and our friends and colleagues think the country is facing. The problem is that we're steadily removing people from being intimately involved in exploration and discovery. We're moving from a world of people boldly exploring the depths of the ocean or living in space to one of drones, probes, and autonomous vessels that really removes people from the forefront of exploration and discovery. Now, there's no question that we live in an amazing time. I mean, we can gather and access data from all over the world. But before we kick it on back and let the machines have all the fun, we don't want to forget how important it is to have people out there exploring, studying, and sharing their discoveries. You know, if we lose the critical ability to uh, get people excited about exploration, you know, what are we going to miss out on? What uh, technological advances are we going to lose? You know, what uh, solutions to major challenges are, are never going to happen? Um, and, you know, I think that there are two main reasons that we want to keep people at the forefront of discovery and exploration and not just doing it remotely. And these really come down to... Uh, inspiration and interpretation. Let's start with interpretation. You know, people really need to experience a place and be intimately involved with it to really know what questions that we can ask. And uh, without being there in the environment, we have the potential to misinterpret data or you know, not know what we can do. Now, there's no question that we uh, live in an incredible time. I mean, we can collect data from all over. And I don't mean to diminish the important role of technology in cutting edge science. But before we uh, lose the high tech, we are before with the high tech, we also really need the uh, high touch. And that brings us to inspiration, which is probably the most important role we can have here. Uh, you see that people out in the environment uh, exploring it can inspire people and spark the imagination like remote data streams just can't. You know, if we lose that critical ability, um, you know, we might lose an entire generation of potential entrepreneurs, inventors, scientists, communicators, and trailblazers. You know, we, we need to have people out there exploring to inspire them. And for me, you know, this one is personal. I mean, Darren talked about it. A lot of people ask us, how did you become a marine, marine biologist when you grew up so far away from the ocean? And for me, it was in Ohio, uh, between the cow pastures and the cornfields. And there were two things that really got me excited. You know, one was a healthy love of the outdoors, but the other was the explorers. Seeing Sir David Attenborough and Jacques Cousteau getting up close and personal with animals or exploring places that I'd never imagined or scientists like Dr. Richard Connor, seeing dolphins at close range and unraveling their private lives really inspired me to want to go do that and learn about these animals in a way that books and uh, you know, just reading about facts never did. But maybe more important than that, it gave me hope. And that was the hope that a kid from Ohio could actually grow up to do this stuff. And uh, with a lot of hard work and some lucky breaks, I've gotten to live my dreams. Um, I've spent 15 years in Australia studying tiger sharks, dolphins, and sea turtles. I've gotten to tag whales in uh, Alaska, explore the Everglades and the Galapagos Islands. And along the way, hopefully learn some things that help protect these places and, and amazing animals. But I feel very strongly with, with uh, the ability uh, to explore these areas comes the responsibility to share what we've learned with the world. And so I've spent the last years traveling around the country, talking to people, showing them 
you know, fantastic videos, including from the backs of animals. Um, I show them great photos and told them stories. What I don't hear a lot is, that's cool. What I do hear is, I want to do that. Or even better, I'm going to do that. And some kids get a head start on it. They head home and they uh, start building their own animal cams in the backyard, or they uh, try to replicate Aquarius in the bathtub. And that's exactly what we want to see. Because it really doesn't matter what these kids do in life, that curiosity and drive is going to really help them out. And hopefully uh, it'll lead some of them to uh, careers in science, uh, engineering, technology, and math. And these fields drive economies. And who knows, you know, maybe one day uh, a kid who's inspired by following along with aquanauts here in Aquarius, who then gets to chat live with them, kind of like we are now, will be inspired to come up with ways to protect coral reefs so that these important ecosystems are around for centuries to come. Or maybe is inspired to develop the next transformational technology in renewable energy. You know, what I can tell you is that it's really important that we have people living down here and up there exploring the oceans, jungles, and mountains, and then sharing those discoveries with people. It matters a lot. You know, it's an amazing world out there. And I hope that you'll get out and explore it yourself and share your discoveries. Have a great night. For now, this is Aquarius signing off.